Okay. This talk is called Save Money Testing Code, the Playback-Based Way. I'm William Clements from Autodesk. Uh, can I get a show of hands of people who have worked with a tool that works by recording something and playing it back? Very good. And how many have done that successfully? Was this tool successful? Hmm, almost as many. And who has all the tools they, have, they need? Oh, no hands on that one. So, a little about me, very little. Code Slinger, about my company. It's uh, the Make Anything Company. Lots of design, manufacturing, software. Yes, it started with AutoCAD. Um, a lot of people ask me what is the subject of my talk, and these are the people who have just heard the talk. So I decided to make it clear. Uh, I'm here to champion the idea of playback-based testing, and specifically for C++ libraries, um, because I believe it's an underutilized framework or uh, uh, you know paradigm. And uh, so the outline of the talk or the things I'm gonna hit on are the library scaling dilemma. As the library gets bigger, problems occur. Um, the anatomy of the playback-based testing itself and uh, a little side journey into what do you mean playback testing never works? Uh, I have an existence proof, Revit journaling, and uh, apparently some of you do too. Uh, and a tour of the CPP player that's just my reference implementation of playback testing for C++. It's just 1,200 lines. It's not any, that's not the subject of the talk. Uh, in just the coming slides in a minute, they're kind of playful or silly, but I'm just trying to show the, uh, the value proposition. In a certain way, I'll consistently talk about library and client. But in your environment, it could be um, you and your colleague that uh, you know have a layered situation, or it could even be you need to use this by yourself. But I'll sort of stick with that as the value proposition. And uh, so I will. This is these keep in minds are just general observations. The library integration quality as an issue is a shared problem between the library author and the client. Playback testing, playback-based testing happens to be a shared solution. And you should, before investing, uh, evaluate whether you're going to get return on investment, of course. And the last suggestion is do it yourself. I don't happen, I, this is not a commercial product that I'm here to sell, and I don't know of any. I didn't find any that exist. It's pretty, it's, you know, pretty simple, basically. So, this is my finger. Your library is inadequately tested, and that's you. You, you can't run all, of, if you have multiple clients, and I hope you do for your library, you can't run all of them, the actual software. It's, it's physically impossible, usually. It could be the US government or, you can't run their software with your library to, to make sure it's still working. And so this is a happy slide. Uh, your library is nicely scaling up and collecting, those are very happy clients. And you keep releasing new versions and they accept them, they trust you. And then, um, Oops. Uh, then you write some more great enhancements and you snag even more happy clients. But you put these enhancements and everyone's uh, keeping up with your library as they should with the version. So, but you may regress the quality for somebody who's an already existing client, unhappy client. 
And the question is, is that a dilemma or a quandary? I'm just joking. Uh, how can we, this, this is also you, how can we qualify our library against so many different clients' needs? Well, let's start talking about it differently. How can we test the integration of that library with each client library or application that uses it? We're not just qualifying our library, we're qualifying the integration. So, my opinion, you need more data from the clients to solve this problem. So the basic idea is work together to capture an exact recording of how they use your library in a live session. Literally, bit for bit, how they called you. So uh, into the uh, playback testing, talking about how what's in it. Um, you want to capture all data that's entering the library, almost as if there's an uh, invisible shell. And this is in the form of every API that, that is called and all the values of the arguments. If you capture all that data and somehow replay it deterministically, you should get the same result. I know there are tons of corner cases, but... Um, now these recordings that you capture from the client, you can bring them back to your lab and play them back in the absence of that client code. So that's getting it to how do you qualify your library without running all of the client code. So does this, the, the idea of playing back recordings and checking the results, does that expose regressions? Oh, there's something wrong. It's, that's not quite the right word. It exposes breaking changes. So you have to go at this kind of with a neutral objective view and it's engineering. You, um, you know, you run ex uh, experiments and everything is very, you, tightly controlled and you keep track. So uh, in the next step, how would you refactor your code, your library? And this is just, so this is how it, in a block diagram, how you would do it. So we have the classic, just single layer, that client is calling into your API, your business logic executes. We want to refactor that simple thing into the three blocks where you have the client application code, you have a middle layer, which is API plus instrumentation plus your business object wrappers, which are what they say they are, but we'll get into it. And then business logic is still the same. Now this looks similar, but it's, um, this is more of a data flow diagram on the left is kind of like the standard configuration or the recording configuration. The client is running, they're generating APIs, and we are capturing them, and we're also executing the business logic uh, in real time on that. Once we have captured those files, they feed into, they can be fed into your test runner which again is just a small program without the client code. And that one goes through the API instrumentation layer and through to the business logic. Just to uh, give something a concrete face, this is, like, this is a captured artifact that uh, we created in my lab and uh, it's in JSON, so uh, you can see the calls. There's the API spelled out, C++, and in this environment, in this uh, sort of play environment, you know, make a lot of simplifying assumptions. But uh, one important factor there is, if it's a one following the API name, then the next number is the function return. So we'll get into that. 
Uh, but JSON is great because you can accommodate programming interface changes by reading in, uh, uh, making uh, simple uh, symbolic changes just in the code of the structure, and then just write it out again. So I think uh, that would help with maintenance. But you know, if you if this is really scaled up as a as a part of your organization, your process, you're going to end up. You know, there's a lot of factors. You're going to end up throwing out some tests that can't can't be uh, brought forward. So a few more engineering, talking about engineering tips, because this is testing. Clean lab. Uh, you will want to have the initial state of the files available that are referenced by the playback artifact. Or it just won't, it won't play back. And um, so no secret backdoor calls. You just, you have to get all the APIs. Endure taxes has to do with more of a scaling up of the process. Uh, it's not the standard way of people do things, and it just it has some uh, unpleasant tasks. Like programmer doesn't is angry that he had to diagnose something that all it is is with the testing environment. It, it didn't it wasn't a real logic error in the code. And so that's unpleasant. Yeah. Um, another tip about this kind of testing, you know, raise exception at the very first opportunity when you notice something missing. It's very check for every little thing. Now, when I asked that question about um, whether you had any experience with recording and playback tools, when I talked to my colleagues, my close colleagues that work on the same product, it was unanimous. It's a very successful, but this is an, uh, a UI, kind of GUI-based recording, but it's the same concept, and it's been incredibly scalable. And if you don't know CAD, computer-aided design type of applications, they just grow and grow and grow with more functionality. And uh, so we test all the functionality that we can. We have 19,000 tests. And everybody who works on Revit, QA developers at least, deal with these playback files every day. It's, you know. So as I, that's what I say. Segue into the case study, or what, what kind of uh, ended up caused me to end up here is that we were faced with a flaky integration. The great library called HFDM, it's a cloud storage framework thing that's going to uh, evolve. And we were an early adopter. And, uh, you know, it was flaky. We had trouble keeping up with the versions and still do. But uh, we happened for our Unit testing, we had created some wrapper objects so that we could have nice, you know, test doubles uh, for our unit tests. And uh, we kind of realized if we wrap all the objects, we can, and we can create a recording and playback tool. And that worked. I uh, actually started that at CPPCon 2017. Um, so, um, one example was a performance problem. We recorded everything that our code, so in a way this doesn't follow the pattern because this was the client doing the work of making a uh, playback layer. Um, we had a performance problem and uh, it was kind of interesting to see, well, it was important to see is it just something somewhere in our code or is it, um, is it inherently something slow about HFDM? And um, we went one pass where we used this tool and uh, the guy was able to, uh, you know, we're spread out all over the world. Uh, I don't remember where he was at the time, but 
He did get the playback tool to work, and he said, okay, I've got everything I need. But the next day, that guy was, had a different job. He was promoted. And we, we ended up coming back around saying, well, we still, don't, we still have the performance problem. So another guy, who I believe is in this room, uh, knew how to run Revit, and we uh, finally isolated the performance problem. So, it, but it takes longer, it took longer, I think, to set it up than to set Revit up, which is a huge install and uses resources than it is for a little test player. Um, so that, it has been used in production, this tool, uh, a little bit. Uh, so, as I said somewhere, kind of distilled the core algorithms of that tool into a CP player that I can put on GitHub. Uh, and uh, it supports, despite the fact that it's called CPP player, it's both recording and playback. It's very small, headers only, open source. Uh, the adoption strategy is right there. So uh, I'd be interested if somebody actually tries to do that. But, um, and this is just a screen capture of the README, which I'm not gonna go into. But um, I guess the main thing is instrumentation. I think people would be interested in, well, what's the cost? Because there's extra code, boilerplate code, now added to your API, and that's sort of unpleasant. So from each instrumented API, you're gonna invoke some sort of record function at the end, and uh, you have to declare and implement a playback method. Uh, this is all based on classes, uh, that objects. So in our simplifying assumption, we said everything has to be a call into an object. So um, the playback method is, or took pains to make sure it's declared as a member function so it can access everything. And uh, uh, my opinion is this type of tool and its many disguises it's almost always grow your own. You're not gonna see, uh, there hasn't been, in my opinion, uh, successful, for example, UI testing engine that people can really use long-term. Uh, obviously, some people will disagree. But grow your own. So I, I don't know if anyone's curious to see more of what's inside this thing. And this is just getting into implementation of this little, of our version of it. So if somebody wants to get back to bigger issues, they can. So uh, this is just the, uh, so going through a few of the basic classes, uh, have an abstraction of the call stream, I've got to somehow serialize the arguments, but uh, JSON is really cool for that. And uh, the pointers to the objects get unswizzled and swizzled as needed. Uh, that's very standard, uh, you know, serialization technology. Now, the, um, the next, uh, a really a lower level kind of object in our prototype or our tool is um, call map, and this is a map with some calls on it, and uh, it's static initialized, one per instrumented line, because, well, you may be doing this with more than one library, so each has to have its own call map. And uh, getting a little bit into some internals, um, the type erased functors outside are so that we can have a simple dispatch mechanism, just get the JSON string that represents one call, all the arguments, the name of the API, and just dispatch it. But inside, they need to be type full lambdas so that we can write method, you know, methods that have access to the object. And uh, so these, this is an argument, this is the last little bit that I am just 
describing, so an argument writer and an argument reader. The argument writer, during playback, uh, pushes each argument in, uh, into a buffer. Actually, it'll be better to look at some code in a minute to show that. So this happens to be the list of files that are up on GitHub. And uh, this is important. Um, I, I was very concerned with, well, how much ugly boilerplate do I have to add to my code? Because my colleague had written this stuff that, you know, was fluent and just returned the value, um, and then I made it ugly. But in this case, what I've circled, that's the record, uh, this is a pretty simple API resolve path to reference. It does have some code here, but you can imagine much more involved APIs. They would still have the same amount of boilerplate, which is at the end, after you have called the function during recording, you just call this record function with the return, return value that you got and uh, the arguments. And C++ knows what the types of the arguments are, so it's no issue for it to kind of serialize those out. Now, on the other side, on playback, is a separate method to the class, and uh, you just call the one thing, which is uh, calling the actual method uh, with, you pop string, that's getting the first argument, so it's just arranges pop, pop int, pop string, and tell it what the function, since this is, this is the live, well, this is on playback, but it's truly, it is calling the library, so we're gonna capture the function return that actually that came from the API itself, and we're gonna compare it to the original function return. Uh, that's one of the things we can compare is to see are things going out of sequence? And uh, so this shows a little bit on the reader side. Uh, this is inside the library. I'm gonna uh, pop the string which has the API name. I'm gonna pop an integer which tells me whether or not there is a function return. And so that's, if it is, I pop a variant uh, to capture the uh, function return value, and then swizzle the pointer. So in order to do this, this object must already exist at this point, because it's the object that, you're, that the method is invoked on. So it gets it from the call stream, unswizzles it, no, swizzles it, and now you have the pointer, uh, so this uses some old-fashioned things like inheritance, uh, <laughs> class inheritance. So um, this is coming to the end, uh, and uh, that's it. Got five, six minutes left. <laughs> Any questions, arguments? Like, um, at, at my current employer, we've uh, tried dealing with playback in a couple different times. Mm -hmm. One of the things that always needs to be solved for each project, it gets solved different ways, is um, the output depends on the ordering of things happening in different threads concurrently. Threads. The timing of it. Have you, have you dealt with that? And how? <laughs> well, God bless you for having that, that problem. Uh, <laughs> Just that we, there are some callbacks, the APIs, but then we record what we do during the callback and it kind of works out. But um, in the larger uh, application I talk, talked about, we have some asynchronous things happening and you, you're gonna have to systematically you know, uh, kind of put things down in a sequence where if we do it 
this is the this is the order we did it in, and on playback, kind of force it into that order. That's the way we handled. It. Okay. Um, so I'm curious: Have you used time travel debugging at all? I have not. Okay. Um, the main reason I mention it is that it seems like it could be substituted for some of the instrumentation on recording, mm -hmm. because you can't use it for things like performance very often, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only on Windows as far as I know, although I guess there are other versions of it. But you could have your debugger emit log messages that told you whatever you want based on a repro captured on a mm -hmm. client site, and then use that in a playback tool mm -hmm. after the fact for your evolving lib. So. That's a great idea. I think there's lots of ways to formulate it, but that's a very uh, sort of current current one. I, we found that uh, I think time travel debugging is only available in the enterprise version of Studio. Uh, so there's one called IntelliTrace for Visual Studio, oh. but WinDPG Preview or WinDPG oh, I know when did, yeah. uh, X, you know, has time travel debugging built in, yeah. and it's. I, I know Windbag really has it. Yeah. Thanks. I just wanted to make a comment on the previous question about yeah. the multi-threaded stuff. Um, a coworker of mine had this library, essentially that could help with this. Um, it's called Step. I don't know if it's public or anything, but the idea is you can have like a daemon that waits mm -hmm. for a specific signal, and then uh, every time you do a call, it could, you could ask it, and then it only like lets it keep going as soon as everything else came in in the right order, so you could kind of force an order. So that's some idea people are thinking about that. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty close to what we have done in the, in the, UI, in the GUI program. Sorry, I just wanted to comment because I kind of work on time travel debugging, and <laughs> um, so the, the, there's one advantage to what you were saying. You can have a recording, which is you know, like recording of the process executing. You can then extract something like what you're recording over here mm -hmm. without instrumenting. Okay, so that being one possibility. Um, but it, it, apart from that, it feels like, you know, killing the mosquito with the cannon, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, something like Tantral Debugging or Undo or RR or whatever you want to use, you know, it's going to be a little more heavy than this. And by a little, I mean <laughs> this much. Yeah, I mentioned, despite the fact I haven't used it, I've known about it for quite a while, and uh, I mentioned it in the, uh, uh, whatever you call it, the uh, summary the, of the, the talk. The abstract, yeah, I, I saw it and... <laughs> <laughs> it just, uh, it's a useful uh, thing to capture uh, data that's current but otherwise would be thrown away. So, yeah, I would, I'd love to integrate it. Now, I don't know if... Um, if anyone's going to have any activity on the Git, GitHub that I presented. Um, but I work 60 hours a week on the product, so I don't know uh, how I'll, fast I'll be able to get to the uh, PRs. But it'd be interesting to see if uh, somebody uses it. Anything else? We're out of, pretty much out of time. Okay, thanks.